Hi, I'm Sissy Graham Lynch. Welcome to Fearless, helping you have a fearless faith in a compromising culture. Welcome back to another episode of Fearless. September is National Recovery Month. We see it all over the news right now, this opioid crisis that is just taking over our country. It's affecting every town and every county in this country. I think every family has probably been affected by some kind of addiction. Statistics say one in seven people in the United States will face addiction. Only 10% of those addicted will receive treatment. That's one in seven. That means when you're at church and you're looking down the row, you're sitting at church, there are many people on your row that are struggling with some kind of addiction. And if you haven't followed me for a long time, you probably don't know my full story, that I myself have struggled three years with an addiction that took over my life. And on today's episode of Fearless, I'm going to share with you my struggle, but the hope that God gave me. And I promise you, if you're struggling with addiction, that Jesus Christ can give you hope. I remember the first time that I noticed my weight, and it was the week before we started my junior year in high school. Volleyball practice had already started, and there was this girl, she was a year older than me, that had walked into the gym in her volleyball uniform, and she looked beautiful, but she had noticeably lost a lot of weight, and she received a lot of negative attention and a lot of positive attention. She looked beautiful, but then people also shared a lot of concerns for her. But I remember that being the first time I noticed my weight. And it was at that moment that Satan started holding me captive. My weight became the first thing I thought about in the morning. It became the last thing I thought before falling asleep. And I became a prisoner in my own skin. I hated myself. I hated it, the secret it became. It first started with food, and then it became an addiction to pills. I had pills hid in my car. I had them hidden in my locker. I had them hidden in my purse, my backpack, all over. And nobody knew I was struggling with this addiction and that it went on for three years. And there's many nights I cried myself asleep. And I was angry with myself because I knew it was wrong. And I was a Christian who was struggling with this, that Satan had bondage in my life and had these chains wrapped around me. And I would cry out to God, let me see myself through your eyes, God. I know I'm perfectly and wonderfully made in your image. God, deliver me from this. And I was upset that that was my heart's desire, and he wouldn't deliver it from me. And I was going to bed thinking about myself at night. And the first thing I would wake up, I was thinking of myself in the morning. And with any kind of addiction, it's self-serving and self-centered. It was me, me, me. And I just wanted God to, to deliver me from it. And for some of us, Managing our weight is about control. For some of us, it's about our looks. For some, it's, you know, depression. For some others, it's to get attention. But for all of those reasons, Satan will tell you lies. And he'll try to grab you with those lies. And I prayed for three years that God would deliver me, and he didn't. And I can't remember an exact date. You know, it was an exact thing that went on in my life. But for me, it was during a time that I decided to take away time from college, and I went to serve in an orphanage in Thailand. And it was there that I was so busy serving these kids and working, I didn't have time to think of myself. I didn't have time to selfishly put myself first in the morning and in the evening. I had to put these kids before me. And it was over that time that I realized God healed my addiction. He took it away because I think for the first time in three years, I was thinking of serving him and serving these children and not myself and not my body. I realized when I got home, I never thought about it again. I never thought about finding more pills. I never thought about my weight. Sure, there are times I think I feel heavier, my pants are fit a little bit tighter, but it doesn't hold me captive. It doesn't give me anxiety anymore. I know that I can get my weight back down or I can be strong and I can be fit and healthy. It doesn't gain strength in my heart and my soul. 
God delivered that from me. And it wasn't at a specific time, but I delighted myself in the Lord, and He finally gave me the desires of my heart. Where I was serving the Lord, I was delighting myself with Him day and night, serving Him, and He gave me the desires of my heart. There's many people that struggle with stories like mine, especially young girls with eating disorders. But you can look at addiction all across the board. And Christians, if it's one in seven people in the United States are struggling with some kind of addiction, that means our churches are saturated with addiction. And what are we doing to address it? And many churches have great recovery programs. And on my show notes, we will list great resources if you yourself are struggling with an addiction or you have a loved one. We have great resources for you. But Christians are quietly struggling with addiction. We look so often how many pastors fall because of an addiction. Because Satan will tell you, to be able to walk out that door, you're going to need something else greater and bigger than God. You're going to need this pill to overcome your anxiety and your fear. You need this pill to overcome the pain that you're feeling, because we as humans don't want to feel pain. So we'll do whatever uh, substance, whether it's alcohol or some kind of painkiller, to take away the pain. We look at whether it just starts with lust in somebody's heart that leads to just a relationship at work that leads to infidelity in a marriage. An addiction, I believe, starts hidden and in secret. So many times through Scripture, God warns us about the darkness of the night and how Satan's temptation comes at night. I was just recently in church, and they were speaking about Proverbs 7, and it's the warning against the adulterous woman. And you can look at this as any kind of temptation in our life. And it says, My son, keep my words and store up my commands within you. Keep my commands and you will live. Guard my teachings as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers and write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and to insight, you are my relative. They will keep you from the adulterous woman, from the wayward woman with the seductive words. Satan is so seductive in everything he says and does. And all the lies he's telling you is going to look pleasing and appetizing. And God tells us right here how to be able to fight the temptation. And that's through God's word and God's word only. But it continues on and it says, At the window of my house, I looked down through the lattice. I saw among the simple. I noticed among the young men a youth who had no sense. He was going down the street near her corner, walking along in the direction of her house at twilight as the day was fading, as the dark of night set in. And how many of us has the addiction started in the darkness of the night? Whether you're on a simple app and you're communicating to a stranger that you don't know and you're talking to them late at night while your spouse is sleeping, so many marriages fall apart because a spouse met somebody on an app? Or how many times have you been awake at night and you're hurting, you're in pain, you're fighting depression, and it's when you're tired and you're exhausted and you're laying in bed and Satan and you're emotional because you're so tired that Satan's lies begin to fuel and the fire begins to burn in you. I've been there. I've been late at night crying and Satan just plants seeds of doubt and hurt and hate in my heart. So be aware of the nighttime. Be on guard. Protect your heart in the night and fight that temptation. And just like Proverbs 7, there's only one way that we can fight temptation. And it's just as Jesus did when Satan came to attempt him, and that's with God's word and God's word only. For those who are really struggling with addiction, I have five tools that I think are helpful. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a theologian. This is what God taught me through my own addiction. And the first one was, we have hope in the gospel. And what is the gospel? The gospel is the good news. And the good news is that Jesus Christ died on a cross to take our sins away. And for that good news, we have to address our sin. And we have to know that we had worth enough, that God loved us enough that he died publicly before the whole world on that cross for you and for me. And that three days later, He rose again from the dead and that he promises that the same power, the Holy Spirit that raised him from the dead would come and live with us 
if we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Those are his promises to us. We have to cling to that hope first and know that that is truth in our life before we can begin to heal. Number two is like we mentioned earlier, is that we have to anchor ourselves in God's word. Just like in Proverbs 7, just as Jesus did when he fought Satan's temptation, Psalm 119.11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. How many people have fallen into an adulterous relationship because they're just, they're seeking something else and they're tempted. And when they're tempted, they're not pulling up God's word in their heart. And that's a conviction to me in so many other areas, even outside of addiction, is that we have to have God's word hidden in our heart. And that was really the basis of this fearless podcast was helping you navigate through this world with God's scripture. And Psalm 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp in my feet and a light on my path. And as we just said earlier, so much of the temptation comes in the darkness of the night, but God tells us what the light is. And the light and the darkness is his word and his word only. Number three is we have to avoid temptation. We can't put ourselves in scenarios where we are we are going to be tempted, whether it's alcohol, whether it's um, gambling and pornography and lust. You can't put yourself in situations where Satan's going to think, yes, I have a little leeway. I have a little open door where I can get into his heart because Satan is coming after you and he's going to fight hard for you. He's going to fight hard for your soul. And we have to avoid temptation for me and my addiction. I used to get on a scale every single day, multiple times a day to see how much weight I'd gained, how much weight I had lost during the day. Since God has redeemed me and ransomed me out of my addiction, I have never owned a scale in my house. I don't put it there. I don't want to even fight the temptation because if I did, I know Satan would use it. Oh, just get it on one more time. Oh, look at that number, sissy. Satan would start the whispers. But when God has healed you, and he has redeemed you from an addiction, you don't go back to where you can be tempted. If you were an alcoholic and God has redeemed you, you don't put yourself around people that are drinking so much or put yourself in a place where you go to a bar or even all these breweries that are so popular now and just trendy. You have to guard your heart and be thankful of how God healed you and not put yourself back in that situation. And when you're avoiding temptation, the Bible says in Hebrews 2.18, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. That's God's word, that Jesus Christ, who was tempted himself, he will help you in your temptation and to guard your heart. And also James 4.7 says, therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Number four is don't do this alone. I had one woman that helped me, and she didn't help me directly in this time. At the moment, she didn't know that I was struggling with a severe addiction, but she loved on me. She invested into my spiritual life. She really wanted to know where I stood before God and help me just grow spiritually and help me serving others and putting myself aside. And she helped rescue me. God used her as a tool in my life, and she didn't even realize it. But I want to encourage you, you don't have to have a big group. You don't have to tell everybody in the world what happened to you or what you're struggling with. But you got to tell somebody and you got you need help. You cannot do it alone because, to be honest, you probably got in this trouble alone when you were by yourself in the darkness of the night. So don't think you are able to get out of it all by yourself. And the last tool is really a personal suggestion from me, something that helped me. It was serve others. God healed me when I took the focus off me. And like I said earlier in the podcast, addiction is all about you. You're self-serving, you're self-seeking. But when you take the focus off you, you serve God and you serve those around you, the focus is just naturally taken off of you. And Matthew 20, 28, one of my favorite Bible verses says, just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus Christ came to serve those around us, and he did it to be a ransom. 
He ransomed you and me. He can ransom you from the addiction you are facing. And I believe it's so important to follow what he did, and that's to serve others, not to be served. Our society and culture is always giving us the wrong message, and it always reinforces our addictions. We live in a society that's always self-serving. We want to glorify ourselves. We want to take care of those sinful desires. And our society tells us that that's okay. But it starts small. We don't lose everything we own in one day because we gambled. It started with the small part of the gambling. We see pastors fall because I believe Satan is coming hard after. You know, we forget our God is big and our God is powerful. And at the end, we've all read the last chapter. We know who wins and holds victory. But Satan is big. God is bigger, but Satan is big and he's powerful and he'll do anything he can to destroy the message and the good news of Jesus Christ, especially in the church. And I don't think we as Christians, I don't believe we are doing enough to protect ourselves and to guard ourselves from all temptation. Whether it's one glass of wine and it starts more and more and more. You know, when somebody became an alcoholic, they never thought it would be that first sip of alcohol and that one day it would lead to them being an alcoholic. When somebody took that first pill after their car accident, they never dreamed Two years later, they would be addicted to painkillers. It starts small. And we as Christians can't put ourselves in temptation like that. We have to be aware. We have to be on guard because Satan is coming to devour us. It is a battlefield that we as Christians are on every single day. It's a spiritual battlefield. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians 6, 12, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. I don't think we can actually grasp the concept of that. The spiritual darkness that is around us all the time, that Satan is coming after our soul. This is a battlefield that we're on every day as Christians, that Satan has wanted to put seeds of doubt, seeds of hate and anger and self-destruction in our life. And he'll do everything he can to destroy you, destroy your relationships, destroy your family, and destroy everything you have. But our God is bigger. Jesus broke all those chains. I love the song, He's a Chain Breaker, because Jesus Christ broke the ultimate chain, and that was death. Death thought it had his grip on him. Satan thought he had won that day in that grave. But Jesus Christ, three days later, broke those chains, and he will break them for you. And the Holy Spirit will convict you, but will you submit to that conviction? I've had people tell me that they don't think that they should drink, but they won't give in to that conviction. They'll keep drinking, and that's scary when you don't submit to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. If you're like me, so many on those nights that I would cry out to God and wonder why he wouldn't heal me. I know so many people were probably saying the same thing. God, I want a marriage that glorifies and honors you. Lord, I want this life that brings honor to you. Why won't you heal me? I don't want this anymore. I know um, people that have died of drug abuse and they cried out to God, why won't you heal me? And Or why won't you take this craving, this temptation away? I'll never forget uh, my dad telling me one time, it was after he had brought this couple to help serve with Samaritan's Purse because he was trying to help save their marriage. And this man is struggling with addiction. And it was a strong Christian guy. And he just said, Franklin, how come God won't take this, this craving away, this temptation away? And my dad said, God might never take that craving away. It's been, you know, 40 years since I've had a cigarette, but I still miss the taste of a cigarette every day. My dad's craving for a cigarette never went away, but he submitted himself to God's authority and to resist the temptation every single day. I'm fortunate enough that God did take that craving away from me, but I do believe if I put myself in certain situations and allow temptation back into my life, that Satan might grab a hold of me again. But for some of you, that craving might never go away. That temptation might not go away. But God is glorified in our weakness. When we surrender and submit to him, where we are weak, he is strong. 
and we can depend on him and the Holy Spirit to walk through with us. Just as God is glorified in our weakness, he's also glorified in when we tell what he's done in our life. For many of us, we can be ashamed of the things we've struggled with, whether it's addiction or something else in our life. Uh, For me, it took a very long time to share my story of addiction before I shared it publicly before the world. But our story is our identity. It's who we are. It's our DNA. It was God's story of redemption in our lives. And God calls us to share it. And it's not about us. And it's not about what we did on our own merit, but what God did through us and how we can bring glory to him and how he saved us and ransomed us. The Son of God hung arms spread open before the whole world with all of our shame, all of our sin upon him. He was mocked and spat on. And he did it because he loved us. He loved me. He loved you, that he believed enough in you. He gave his life up for you so that he may be glorified through you. And he did it before the whole world. He didn't do it privately. He didn't do it secretly. He did it before the whole world. And I want to encourage you to tell your stories to those. Use it for God's glory. It doesn't have to be public on a podcast like mine. It might be just in your small group amongst girls. I remember the first time I ever shared my story of addiction, just even privately, was in a Bible study. And I had no idea why God laid it on my heart to share. And this girl that I had struggled for a long time, it was our first year in the NFL, And I always thought she was kind of snotty a little bit. She wasn't very friendly. She had been in her husband had been in the NFL for a long time. And this was her first Bible study she ever came to. And I didn't know she was coming, but the Lord had already laid on my heart to share my story of addiction. She later, later came up to me. I didn't know she had just given her life to Christ. And she was shaking and crying and said, thank you for sharing your story, that you had struggled with it before because I have struggled with addiction for years. And God has redeemed me. Your story is powerful. God will use it for your, his glory. So I want to encourage you to use it in whatever manner he's called you to share it with somebody to help them walk through the same thing and help give hope to others. I want to thank you for joining me on another episode of Fearless. Thank you for allowing me to share my story with you of how God redeemed me from a very dark time in my life. If you are struggling with an addiction in your life or you know somebody that is struggling, I encourage you to get help or to help them. In my show notes, I have listed great resources for you. And you can also check out on billygram.org more resources to help you fight addiction and find hope in Jesus Christ. One more thing, I would like to dedicate an upcoming episode of Fearless to answering some of your questions. I get asked questions all the time regarding different subjects, and I would like to take the time to answer them. So if you have a question for me, as long as it's nice and kind, I would be glad to answer it. And you can submit a question via Instagram through a direct message or Facebook. Once again, thank you for joining me on another episode of Fearless. I'm Sissy Graham Lynch. I was